their support act. Um, because I think, Mr. Brayman, what, what this has established about having no trainings in Irvine and that you only have a part time SWAT team is that everyone on the jury now has uh, moved to Irvine. Yeah, anyway, right. but, but so let, me ask, let me ask you this question. Um, uh, Mr. Brayman asked you how many, you haven't ever been recognized as an expert in use of force. And you said that's not true, and then he didn't follow up to say how many times you've been recognized as an expert in use of force. Can you tell the, the court that? Yes, I've been uh, accepted as an expert in use of force for a shooting case in uh, federal court in Chicago, and in another shooting case in federal court, um, I can't recall the city, in northern Georgia. Okay. Thank you. Just all the questions I have, we can approach the next chat. May approach.
um, had experience with mentally ill people, and, and let's first of all start with your training. You said you had CIT training. Can you tell the jury, first of all, <coughs> what CIT is and what kind of training you had? Sure, I, I had training beginning in the police academy about dealing with uh, individuals with mental illness, but I specifically went to a 40-hour class on what's called crisis intervention training. Uh, that class is designed, uh, initially it started in Memphis, Tennessee uh, years ago uh, in order to better equip officers to be able to um, uh, speak and, and to deal with people who may be in crisis. Uh, so uh, we're given specific training uh, techniques and ways to talk to people and ways to behave in order to try and talk somebody down. For example, talking lower and slower, trying to keep things calm, trying to persuade people uh, into uh, following what it is we're looking for. Um, and have you, when you were in the field, um, had experience dealing with mentally ill persons? Oh yeah, all the time. Okay, can you tell the jury about that experience? Yeah, we, we deal as police officers all over the country, and, and for me particularly, you know, um, dealing with people who are suffering from uh, mental health uh, issues, attempt suicides, uh, people on the streets that, that are uh, uh, suffering from all sorts of mental illnesses uh, that, that police respond to. That's a very common response for every police officer across the country. Okay. Um, Jenna, at this point, I would tender uh, Chief uh, Noble uh, in the area of use of force. Um, the objections were noted on the record. Anything more? No? Okay. Um, over defendant's objection, I'm going to go ahead and qualify uh, Mr. Noble in those areas. And I'd ask that you just return towards Exhibit 1 to the reporter. Okay, Chief, I think that the question we started off on that I was off on the qualification thing was why it's important to try and minimize the use of force, particularly deadly force, by police officers in society. Why is that important? As police officers, we have a responsibility to do everything in our power to minimize uh, the force that we use. We, we work for the people. Uh, our job is to respond to situations, to keep the peace, to enforce the law, and, to, and, and we certainly have the authority and the duty times to make arrests. Uh, the authority and the duty to use force, unlike we have authority beyond that of ordinary citizens. Um, and so we need to take every step and every precaution that we can to minimize. Sometimes force has to be used. Um, but when we can minimize it, we should. Okay, and what happens if you don't do that? What happens if you just say, we're gonna let the police officers do whatever they want out there in the field? What happens? Well, we'd lose again. Again, the police work for the people. The police are nothing more than an extension of the police, of the people. Uh, Sir Robert Peel back in the 1800s said that the people are the police, the police are the people. Uh, if police officers are going about using, acting in, in unprincipled ways and, and totally unaccountable, that there would be no trust from the people. Uh, it, it would lead to all sorts of issues that would harm the, the greater good of our country. What do you say to people who say, Hey, look, the police have a tough job, and when they use force to hurt or kill somebody, we shouldn't second guess them. What do you say to that? Well, the police do have a tough job in many, many respects, but the police also receive training and they, they have policies in order to hold them accountable. Um, and they should be granted deference in some areas. Um, you know, for example, in use of force, uh, the police should be granted deference for the fact that they often deal to tense, rapidly uh, evolving circumstances. Um, and sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes they are required to make very fast decisions and sometimes uh, split second decisions. Okay, and um, how about, what do you say to the concept of we shouldn't in hindsight, or use hindsight to evaluate these situations? What do you say to that? No, that's not true at all. Um, if we didn't use hindsight, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, if we didn't do, use hindsight, we would never judge or never hold an officer accountable for anything. So if we never look back, I mean, the only way to go to look at an incident is to go back and look at it, to use hindsight to go back and review it. Um, and, and we do that as internally within the department to hold people accountable for disciplinary issues. Uh, we do it in our court systems, whether criminally or civilly. Um, we always go back and use hindsight. What, what, what's meant by not using 2020 hindsight is that we don't want to be hyper hypercritical. We don't want to look at things that, that the officer didn't know. So in any situation, you know, you, you can only evaluate a situation based on what the officer knew at the time. So if some other facts come up later, and we, you know, it turns out that uh, there are other facts that may play into, well, for example, let's say it's a toy gun. 
uh, but it's a replica gun. Chair, this is the um, can you give me an example of situations um, that, that that apply to that? When we're talking about uh, to hindsight. That there are there are things you shouldn't do in hindsight, and what you said was to not be hypercritical. What do you mean by that? I, what I mean by that is you you know things will happen, mistakes will happen, and you shouldn't be hypercritical of the mistakes. What you should be what you should look for is is reckless actions that display a disregard or indifference to uh, the, the dangers or the consequences of the officer's actions. Okay. Um, why shouldn't we just let the police department regulate itself? Well, many police departments... Sustained. Um, should, do you have any problem with having a civilian jury review or look at, in hindsight, the actions of a police officer? Sustain. Um, what would happen if the killing of a civilian could never be reviewed by a jury outside the police? Same objection. Sustain. Um, you talked about who the police work for. I'm going to ask you a question about who they are sworn to protect and serve. Because I think you already talked about who they work for. Is that a question? I don't know if it's a question. That's it. That's a question. Who Can you repeat the, the question? I'm sorry. Who are the police sworn to protect and serve? Is the question. The people. Does that include people in the community who are suffering from mental illness? Includes everybody. Somebody who has dementia? Yes. Um, veterans who are coming back from the war with PTSD? Yes. Um, teenagers or college students whose cognitive abilities are impaired by alcohol or drugs? Sexual relevance. Um, let me ask a very specific question. Does it, are police officers sworn to protect the people even with schizophrenia? Yes. Um, are there times, um, well, well, do police officers have either SOPs or rules of engagement uh, to help their officers know when use of force is appropriate? Yes. And, if, and if, do those include around the country in the places you've, you've reviewed shooting cases, do they often include SOPs on the use of deadly force as well? No reasonable police department would not have SOPs on use of force. Why are, are SOPs or rules of engagement um, uh, important? They set the limits on the officer's uh, uh, discretionary decision making. It, it sets um, um, follow with training. It, it gives direction for the officers on how they should perform their job and, and um, um, engage in their duties and responsibilities. Okay. And um, how do police officers find out about what the SOPs are and what, they, what, what their limitations are? Uh, they receive training. Okay. And so it's not enough just to write a rule. Do you think it's appropriate that they also be trained in those rules? No, they have to be trained in those rules. And did APD have standard operating procedures or rules of engagement as well? Yes. And did you review those in connection with your opinion in this case? Yes. Okay. I want to start. Um, with those SOPs and what they meant and how they were applied in this particular case. And I'd like to start with, well, before we, before we go into the SOPs, so the other things you did is you actually reviewed um, evidence in this particular case, did you not? Yes. Uh, can you tell the jury what kinds of evidence you reviewed in this case? Uh, I reviewed all the police reports, the, the investigation. I reviewed some of the videos. Um, I reviewed... Um, uh, the photographs of the scene, um, uh, the uh, computer-aided dispatch records, uh, interviews of uh, different witnesses and some of their training materials. Okay. Um, and then did you go back and look at the SOPs and apply the principles of the SOPs to the situation in this shooting case? Yes. All right. Well, let me ask, ask you first about SOP 2. 52.3 H and I. I think there it is. Um, these two together about officers are expected 
uh, not to escalate a situation for the need to use force. And then the second one about not engaging in unreasonable actions or tactics that precipitate or cause the use of force. Um, can you tell me um, what those mean in layperson's terms? They essentially are, are giving the officers direction that they shouldn't engage in tactics or actions um, that would tend to take a situation and cause it to escalate to the point where force becomes necessary. Um, so if you have a situation where, where force is otherwise not necessary, you shouldn't do something that causes you, to puts you in a position where you now have to use force. Okay, and how do you avoid doing that? Well, this is how we train our police officers. We, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching about tactics and, and how to deal with situations. This is how we, we spend a great deal of our training time with officers, is to teach them about tactics and, and how to create distance and time, become knowledgeable about a situation, be patient and work through a situation in order to avoid escalating a situation. Okay. Um, and um, they also, I think in this segment, there is also uh, E, Section E, let me find that here, where they go through a list of things that by themselves are not enough um, to justify use of force. Um, and so let me ask you about those, um, that direction to the law enforcement officers. Uh, and let's start with number one. If they know that a subject has uh, violent tendencies, previous encounters with law enforcement, even which were combative, um, can a police officer shoot somebody for, for just that? Not based on that alone. Okay, and why not? Because that alone, the, the key in any use of force is the immediate threat. And, and it all, these are all factors you look at to help you determine whether there's an immediate threat. But the key is whether or not there's an immediate threat. Okay. Um, so if there's no immediate threat, the simple fact that they have, um, you know, a lot of people have histories of committing crimes. Um, and we can't use force on them simply because they have a history. You can't just walk up and shoot somebody who you know is a gang member for example. It's actually leading out. Okay. Oh, let me rephrase. Can you just shoot up and can you just walk up and shoot somebody who you know is a gang member? No, of course not. All right. Um, so the fact that that um, defendant Sandy or defendant Perez knew that Mr. Boyd had a history of running from police, physical confrontations with police when resisting arrest, was that sufficient for them to use deadly force on uh, Mr. Boyd? No, not in and of itself. Okay. Um, and then they talk about, uh, in number seven is where I wanted to go next, the subject's mental or psychiatric history. And they have a, have a second paragraph there where it's apparent to the officer that a subject is in a state of crisis, this must be taken into account in the officer's approach to the situation. Can you explain to the jury what that means and how that's taken into account in the officer's approach to the situation? Sure. Really, this is two factors. The first is that when you have somebody who has, that's obviously suffering from a mental illness, it is one of those factors that where you may uh, end up having to use force among many other factors. Uh, but when you have somebody who is suffering from a mental illness, and as this specifically states, when you know that they're in crisis, um, you need to take that into account on your approach because you, because where someone else may not react in a particular way, somebody who's in crisis may. So it tells you to slow down, engage more tactics, bring in more officers, bring in more tools, take your time. Okay, and as far as a, a, a department that has CIT trained officers, what should be, what should you do if you know somebody is having a crisis or uh, has mental illness? If you have a CIT officer, you should certainly bring that officer because that officer has additional training beyond that of every other officer. Uh, so you want to put your best assets forward. If you have somebody that's available that can, that's a CIT trained and you have somebody who's in crisis, you want to use a CIT officer to, to speak with the individual. Okay. Then number four, the number of subjects compared to the number of officers. Tell me how that comes into play in making your analysis about whether somebody is a threat. Well, again, when you're doing a threat analysis, you're looking at the officers outnumbered. If there's a, you know, a lot of, of people there and an officer by himself or maybe one other officer. So, that, so numbers matter in that sense that it's one factor to look at if, you're, if an officer's outnumbered or even if they're only one-on-one. -on -one. Um, when the officers have more, off, if there's a lot of officers to one person, again, it's a situation where you can slow things down, take your time, and try and resolve things peacefully. Okay, and then it also, number five, talks about what kinds of uh, availability of weapons there are to the subject. Um, and does it also matter what weapons are available to the police when you're looking at whether there's a risk of imminent harm? 
Yes. Okay, can you tell the jury how those things come into play? Well, first you want to look at what's available to the suspect. So if the suspect has a rifle, uh, the distance increases. If he has a handgun, the distance is much further out because those, those weapons can shoot a long ways off. Um, if they have a, a, a knife or a blunt force instrument, then you can be closer. Um, and if the officers, uh, um, when they recognize this, what we generally have our officers do is we have our officers deploy uh, various def different types of weapons. We have officers deploy their handguns, that they always have, uh, their tasers, which are often on their belts, maybe a shotgun taser. Uh, um, you, uh, certainly you can have uh, SWAT officers respond with 308 rifles so we can put snipers out at a distance uh, in order to stop a threat. Um, uh, f uh, flashbangs, noise light, diversionary devices, batons, or, you know, whatever the tools that are available to officers. You want to bring as many tools uh, to the incident as you can, again, to have those tools available in case you need it. Okay, and then there was also this one, which is, let me get the right quote, 2525F, that talked about they're expected to recognize and utilize positions of advantage, cover, concealment. Can you explain to the jury what that means? Right, again, this is about you know, taking a tactical advantage. If, if you have cover, you should use it. Uh, if you have distance, you should take advantage of it. Um, the difference between cover and concealment, uh, cover would be you know, a, a, one of these giant boulders that, that we're seeing that you can't shoot something through, or, or concealment may be this, this thin uh, uh, wooden wall where you can shoot through it, but I can hide behind it. Uh, so officers are trained what the difference between cover and concealment is and when to appropriately use those types of uh, uh, tools. Okay, and I want to talk about a difference between a gun and a knife because I think they asked Chief even a bunch of questions about if he has a gun and somebody's reaching for a gun. Mr. Boyd didn't have a gun, did he? No. All right. Um, is there a difference when you're dealing with somebody with a knife versus somebody with a gun? Yeah, again, with a gun, you know, you, your distance is going to be much greater. You know, a, um, you know, a handgun, you, know, you want to be a minimum of 100 yards, even more. A rifle, you want to really extend your distance as, as much as possible, or you want to have be in a position to cover something they can't shoot through, uh, so if you have to quickly respond. Uh, where a knife, a knife can only, you, you have that distance, um, a sh much shorter distance, uh, where somebody can, you know, imminently or immediately attack you with a knife, so you would move in uh, much closer. Okay. Are there things officers can do to protect themselves from, from a knife that don't work if the defendant has a gun? <laughs> yes. And what things are those? Well, again, if, if somebody has a knife and, and they don't have a gun, and you know that, you can be closer. So you establish you establish multiple layers. You establish lethal coverage. You have people with guns who can engage the suspect immediately if he starts, if there's an immediate threat, if he starts in actively moving toward us. Uh, you have people engaged with things like beanbag shotguns, tasers, whether they be a, a handheld taser, which generally effective to about 15 feet. Some officers have extended tasers that go up to about 21 feet. Um, most officers, I don't know that any officer here had a 21 foot uh, uh, handheld taser. Um, you you want to have, um, so you want to have a combination of officers assigned to less lethal, uh, you know, types of, of tools that are not likely to cause a person's death. And certainly you want to have lethal tools uh, immediately de deployed uh, to prevent an, uh, an immediate attack. Okay. and. Um do officers, and did these two officers, have training in something called the Tuller Drill? Yes. Um, Based on lack of foundation, Your Honor, he's already testified that he doesn't know what their training is. Well, Stan, uh, uh, let me lay it for the foundation. Did you review the training materials um, for Officer Perez um, that, that were supplied by the Academy to see whether he had training in the Tuller Drill? Yes. Okay. And did he have training in the Tuller Drill? Yes. And is it your understanding from reviewing um, the expert uh, um, uh, interviews from Mr. Bregman that um, they also trained Defendant Sandy in the Tuller drill? I, I didn't hear the first part of that. Basically. Reviewing the interviews of the experts that you're going to call, or the people from the State Police Academy that you're going to call, do you have uh, a basis to believe that Defendant Sandy also had training in the Tuller drill? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may, may I have him come down and, and, and we've created, have, have we created a demonstrative aid to help the jury understand the Tuller drill? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Can you first maybe explain to the jury just 
just quickly sort of how the tumor drug got developed. We have a small problem. Yes, Your Honor? I can't see it, and counsel can't see it. Okay, let me push it. Let me push it back so you can see it. That's the most important. Maybe counsel can move to be able to see this diagram. I think it's also in your exhibit, exhibit 60, Your Honor. Okay. Um, defense counsel can move to the side of the room, and it's okay if you'd like to stand. Otherwise, you can use one of the chairs. Okay. Can you tell the jury how this got developed, first of all? Uh, there was a lieutenant named um, Tuller uh, who worked, I believe, for uh, the Salt Lake City Police Department. And in 1983, he published an article in, I believe it was Law and Order magazine, a policing magazine, uh, where he discussed where, where he was a, a police officer trainer in training and use of force. And he engaged with some of his colleagues in some conversations of how long it would it take somebody with an edge weapon like a knife uh, how much distance could they cover before an officer, if the officer had his hand handgun in his holster uh, and, and snapped down? How far away should the officer be from that person with a knife to be able to draw their, their handgun and shoot uh, at the suspect before the suspect could get to them? So he set up a number of experiments. And again, he's not a, he wasn't a scientist. Um, you know, there's no peer-reviewed journal articles on this. He just, you know, as, as, a, as a police officer, he said, hey, this makes sense. I'm concerned about it. So he set up some, some experiments, and he had different people with different skill levels uh, run at different police officers who had different skill levels, and kind of try to make some sort of estimates of how far back a police officer needs to be. And he determined that it took about a, a suspect from 21 feet, about one and a half seconds to cover it of one and a half feet. And it took an average officer about a second and a half to be able to draw their handgun from the holster and to be able to shoot. Okay, let me put up, let me put up exhibit uh, 60 so you can uh, uh, talk about the distance and how they did that. Yes, and, and, and let me ask you, the tumor drill was done with the gun in what position? The tumor drill was done with the gun in the holster. All right. Um, and is that, in Exhibit 60, does that depict um, the, the uh, findings of the tumor drill? Well, you have, have an individual here with a, uh, he's representing a person with an edge button like a knife, uh, and the officer standing 21 feet away with the gun in his holster. Okay. And did that information get put out into the police departments across the country to help train police officers? It did. It did. And, you know, for years it was called the tumor rule. It never was a rule. Uh, but what it really is, is and what, even what the article says, it, it is that you, know, that, that you should be cautious. If you're engaged with, if you're dealing with somebody who has an edge weapon, that you're, if you're within this 21 feet, that you should be looking for cover. You should be calling for follow-up officers. You should draw your hand in. That's what the article says. Okay. And so what happens if your gun isn't in your holster, but that you have a long weapon and it is pulled out and Stay 21 feet back or not? Well, again, these situations different. So when you're looking at how far away you need to be, so when they did these experiments, they did them in a in a room, probably a mat room, someplace that, you know indoors, flat. You know, so it, um, subsequent articles have pointed out that you know you, there's a lot of factors. You need to look at the terrain. Are right? you going uphill, downhill? Are there obstacles? Uh, you need to look at the skill level. I mean, is the suspect displaying some type of superior skill, like he's a martial artist or something, in the skill level of the officer? Um, so uh, you need to look at a lot. You know, is, is the ground dry? Is it, is it just raining? Is it wet? Is it slippery? So you need to look at all the environmental factors and, and the, and the uh, factors of the officers, um, first of all, in order to make any kind of assessment of where you should be. Um, and second, if you have your firearm out, you don't need to draw it. So that would certainly decrease the amount of time. Where that, where that matching number is, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but it would decrease it. And it depends on the, si the situation on the ground, does it not? Right. I believe in your honor. Let me rephrase that. What does it depend on? Well, it depends on all those factors I, I talked about. So it would depend on you know, whether what the terrain looks like, what, who you're dealing with, who you are, um, the, you know, whether or not you're there by yourself, whether or not you have other officers that also have, you know, in this example, you have one officer. Now, if you have multiple officers with lethal options and less lethal options, and maybe even a sniper with a 308 rifle trained out, that, that changes the scenario. 
Okay, and, and what is faster, a person or a bullet? Well, certainly a bullet. Okay, and, and in, even at this close, between 9 and 12 feet, um, which would be faster at reaching the person, the bullet, or would the, would the person with the knife be faster at reaching the officer? The bullet. Okay. Um, and, and you said there are other factors that may come into play. What if there are there is something between the person with the knife and the person with the gun um, that might uh, might keep the person with the knife from getting the person to the to the person with the gun? How does that affect the Yeah, anything, anything in between any kind of obstacle, whether it be a rock, a bush, a car, a dog, anything that falls in between them that uh, is going to kill the person down. Okay, and I have a dog here. So, um, and, and you're aware in this particular case that between um, uh, Canon Officer Weimer Sturch and um, uh, Defendant Sandy, there was a dog. Objection leading. Well, can you tell me what was between them? I'm going to let you put the dog on the, on the picture. The dog was in front of a, a Weimer Sturch uh, on the ground. Um. And what effect does that have about whether this person is an imminent threat to this person here? Well, it's, it's, again, it's just one factor. I mean, you, you don't know. You don't know whether that dog's going to react. Uh, the dog already didn't react once. Um, but, you know, when you have you know, any object there that's just in the way, it's going to slow things down. Okay. And if the dog did attack, would that also provide additional? Of course. A safety. Okay. Thank you very much. You can sit back down. Thanks. <laughs> or starting to fight. Um, in your opinion, did either of these defendants unreasonably violate those rules of engagement in dealing with James Boyd? One of them did. Okay. Can you tell the jury? Uh, let, let me start a little bit back before we get to the shooting itself, and let me ask you about the decision to remove the CIT officers and replace them with, a t with the tactical officers. Do you have an opinion about whether that was a good decision or a bad decision? Yes, I have an opinion. Okay, and what is your opinion? Uh, it, was, um, it was a very poor decision. Okay, why do you say that? Again, you have, you have a, C, a CIT trained individual. You actually have two of them at the scene. Uh, you know, they've been, he's been negotiating for some period of time. Uh, you want to assess the progress, if any. Uh, you want to assess the opportunities for whether there's an opportunity for additional progress. If that particular CIT officer isn't making a connection, you have another CIT officer. You use that other CIT officer. Um, but you want to use your, your best resources, and that's your CIT officers. Okay. Um, were, have you reviewed and are you aware of the discussion between Defendant Sandy and Defendant Weimerskirch at the bottom of the hill about, they call it later, I think, a plan? Yes. Do, do you, first of all, do you think they really had a plan? Well, there was some discussion. I mean, there was some sharing of ideas uh, that, that ultimately resulted in, in, in the actions that the officers took. Okay. Was there something missing from the plan? If their plan really was to arrest James Boyd? Well, there was a lot missing from the plan. Okay. What, what was missing from the plan? Well, this is a situation where um, it's really undisputed that Mr. Boyd was, was dangerous. Uh, Mr. Boyd had made threats throughout the day that he was going to kill officers, that he was going to stab officers. Uh, he had committed an aggravated assault against a police officer. He had a history of schizophrenia. Uh, he had, um, uh, he was armed, he had knives, and he had threatened people with them. Uh, he did not surrender when uh, he was directed to, um, and, and he was, um, you know, over a course of over three hours where multiple officers gave him opportunities to surrender, uh, and he didn't surrender. Uh, there's no question that, that Mr. Boyd was dangerous and he should be treated as a dangerous individual. And that's why there were 19 police officers there. That's why when Sergeant Fox arrived, he quickly made the determination to activate the SWAT team. 
Okay. And let me stop you before we get to Sergeant Fox, and let me ask you just about the plan that these guys came up with. And can you t tell me which three officers were talking about this plan? The plan developed between Officer Sandy, Officer Weimer Scourge, and uh, Acting Sergeant uh, Ingram. Okay. And, and Ingram and Sandy were with the ROPE team? Yes, that's my understanding. And Weimer Scourge is the canine officer, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and they had a conversation at the bottom of the hill about 7.06, and have you listened to the tape of that particular conversation? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, at this time, Judge, uh, we would offer Exhibit 10I, which is the excerpt of the conversation at 7.06, the Weimer Scourge uh, Ingram Sandy conversation. Any objection? I'm not going to I offer you to play the tape of the conversation at 7.06 between the three of them. At, it's 10i. It's a, a piece of Officer Weimer Scourge taste. I just, I just would have objected to say that there's nobody here right now. Please, this witness can't identify what the voice is. So I, I don't think it's broken way to do it. I'm not, I didn't stipulate, I don't think, to this particular. Right, Judge, I'm not going to ask him to identify the voices. Uh, I, and I'm not going to ask him to do that. This is the tape. There's no dispute. This is Officer Weimerskirch's tape at the, at the bottom of the hill at 706, I don't think. And we can lay a foundation through Jeff Stone. What I'd like to do is play it through this expert and talk to him about this finding. I guess we can, I just have him talk about it. If they need to lay a foundation through another witness, they need to lay that first before this witness testifies. We can have him talk about it. All right. No I'll, just, I'll just have you talk about it, and we'll play it tomorrow through. To Jeff Stone. So one, one but, moment, though, Ms. Okay, because we have another question for right. Attorney. Another question. Another question. We'll mark it as courts too. Okay. Chief Noble, you have reviewed the tape that hopefully we will get in tomorrow of the jellyfish conversation at the bottom of the hill at 706. Can you tell the jury about that, please? One of the officers uh, made a comment about uh, um, using the canine and using the taser shotgun to use the taser shotgun and then follow up. Judge. 
this is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but the basis for his opinion, and it's something he reviewed in his opinion. It's overall. Okay, you can go ahead and answer. That, uh, and I believe it was Weimer Scourge who, who said that, uh, you know, he was concerned about using the taser shotgun first because uh, the taser may cause the dog to disengage, that the dog may not be effective if the taser darts missed um, by having the, the darts, because when the shotgun tasers, it automatically activates for a 20 second period. Uh, and by having these, these wires on the ground and having the canine, that it may cause the canine to, to not engage. Okay, and so the, the people that were standing around in that conversation, that's, a, that's actually a video where you can see the people in the picture, were um, were who were, were who were the two other officers who were there in this discussion? Uh, the three officers were Weimer, Skirsch, Sandy, and Ingram. Okay, and then there is another conversation that's on Mr. Mr. Uh, Officer Weimer Skirch's tape at 7:16. And can you tell the jury please about that conversation at 7:16? Uh, that was a conversation that uh, about. Um, uh, using the flashbang and using the uh, um, shotgun taser uh, in order to uh, arrest Mr. Boyd. Okay, and, and did anyone say on that that, that, was there any reluctance to do that while they waited for other weapons? Yeah, there, but there was a comment, I believe it was by... Right? Same objections before, this is hearsay, but no saying. Okay. Same response? Same response, Judge, yes. Okay, you can answer that they wanted to wait because they had requested a beanbag shotgun. So they said, you know, let's wait until we get the beanbag shotgun up here. Okay, and did, did somebody else, was there a voice that said, we can do it? Yes, that's what I heard. Okay, and, and you can't tell us wh whose voice that was that said that? No, I don't know. Okay, um, so, look at that. Um, um, let me ask you about, in this, the, what you heard of the plan from these various tapes, if the plan was to try to arrest Mr. Boyd, what crucial, if that really was the plan, what crucial thing was missing from the arrest of Mr. Boyd? Well, among the issues of the arrest specifically is no one was identified to go hands on. Uh, somebody needs at some point to actually go up and grab him, put handcuffs on him. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, the plan was. Uh, that Officer Sandy would be on lethal coverage. He was carrying a uh, rifle. His hands were occupied. Uh, Officer Weimer Skirts had to control his dog. His hands were occupied. Uh, and uh, Ingram uh, had two taser shotguns and a rifle. So he had all these things over his shoulders that, you know, and you can't, when you go up to put handcuffs on somebody, you don't want, you can sling it, it's, you know, your rifle, but you don't want to put those types of, of weapons in the the grasp or potential grasp of somebody. So if now if you get into a wrestling match or you start fighting with them, uh, you don't want those types of weapons to be in there because they're not as secure as your handgun that is locked down in a holster. So nobody was identified to actually handcuff them. Nobody was identified to go hands on. Okay. Nobody was identified to be the one who actually arrested him. <laughs> well, thing. was there someone identified to actually even arrest him of those three guys who decided to go up after 716? No. Okay. What changed um, between 716 and when they started up about 725, 728. What, what physical thing changed? Sergeant Fox arrived. Okay, can you tell the jury who Sergeant Fox is and, and what difference that would have made? Sergeant Fox is a SWAT sergeant. Sergeant Fox is the, uh, the guy that uh, was going to be deploying the SWAT team. Um, he had uh, directed uh, Officer Ornelius, who's one of the SWAT team leaders up the hill, to evaluate this circumstance. Uh, Amelia ended up going back down because of, of this request for the beanbag shotgun. Uh, so, you know, for police officers, they know when SWAT arrives, the SWAT's going to take over the call. That the people on that interior perimeter, they're going to be moved out. SWAT officers are going to be moved in. Okay. And what is that? What did that mean as far as uh, whether Sandy Ingram and Weimer Skirch were going to be able to go up and make the arrest after SWAT arrived? Well, it'd be less likely. It would depend on the resources and the judgment of Sergeant Fox, but most likely, if they had SWAT officers available, he'd be moving his more trained officers, those SWAT officers, into that position to, to make the arrest. Okay, and um, when they moved up, after they said at 716, we're not going to do this, we're going to wait, then they moved up at 728 or so, did they radio to anybody what their plan was? No. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I think we're at a good breaking point because the next thing we're going to do is go in, start going through the videotape and talking about the videotape.
Um, and that may be a good place to start tomorrow. Yes, and it's, it's just a few moments before 5, so okay. we'll take a break for today. Um, I just want to read our recess instruction to you. During recess, do not discuss this case with other jurors or with any other person or allow anyone to discuss the case with you or in your presence. You as jurors must decide this case based solely on the evidence presented here within the four walls of the courtroom. This means that during the trial, you must not conduct any independent research about this case, the matters in this case, and the individuals or corporations involved in the case. In other words, you should not consult dictionaries or reference material, search the internet, websites, blogs, or use any other electronic tools to obtain information about this case or to help you decide the case. Do not try to find out information from any source outside the confounds of the courtroom. Until you retire to deliberate, you may not discuss this case with anyone, even your fellow jurors. After you retire to deliberate, you may begin discussing the case with your fellow jurors, but you cannot discuss the case with anyone else until you have returned a verdict and the case is at an end. I know that many of you use cell phones, the internet, and other tools of technology. You also must not talk to anyone about this case or use these tools to communicate electronically with anyone about the case. This includes your family and friends. You may not communicate with anyone about the case on your cell phone or any other device that can access the internet through email, text messaging, or on Twitter, through any blogs, websites, or through any internet chat room or by way of any social media networks. During your deliberations, you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone by any means about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media, such as a telephone, cell phone, or any device that can access the internet. Um, any internet service, any text or instant messaging service, or any internet chat room or by way of any other social media websites. Um, and you cannot communicate at all until this case is, or until I accept your verdict. Avoid any publicity this case may receive. Do not read, listen, listen to, or watch any news accounts of the trial. Do not express any opinion about the case or form any fixed opinion until the case is finally submitted to you for your decision. So thank you so much for your attention today and your time. Um, I hope you have a pleasant evening. And please return to the jury assembly room on the first floor at 8.50 tomorrow morning. Please rise for the jury. I just ask that you may not, not discuss your testimony with anyone until it's complete. Um, and then I just want to ask some housekeeping questions of the attorneys. So, John, I have something for you, too. Could it be the, can you cut it off the slides that we use for our opening statements so that you have them for your record? Yes. So, and I'll need that from the defendants as well. We need a record of the opening statement. For, we'll mark this. Um, Ms. McGinn, do you know? How far you're going to go in your exhibit numbers? Uh, uh, 69 is our last one. So why don't we make that 70? Jeff? Okay, so we'll mark the opening statement slides as states 70. Does defense have a copy for the record now, or do you need some time to do that? For us to give you our exhibits, I don't have that. I don't even know actually how to get you that. I could, I could I actually could give them mine. What's that? I could give them mine. If you could give them your animation, Judge, that would be great. Okay, and so then, I won't identify. I won't identify it right now with um, a letter because I don't have it on me. I don't believe. Mm -hmm. 
Well, maybe I do. Let me check. Sandy, letter what? You say letter? Yes, it's going to be a letter. Um, it would be letter <coughs> what? I'm sorry, which thing are we talking about here? The picture? The animation. Oh, the animation. Why don't we make that um, AA? Okay. And um, that will be defendant Sandy's double A. And just for people who are observing, you're, you're welcome to stay. The rule about not getting up until we're not in session is really my concern about the jury and anything interfering with them paying attention. So if you'd like to go, you can. Yeah, can I uh, approach and give the court reporter BB5, which was the picture of the neighborhood that was shown? Right. OK, so that's going to be BB. B, B, B is going to be BB5. Five. And then what about the photographs of the two knives? Photographs of the, of the comment. Oh, I'm sorry. The two knives are exhibits E2 and E4. <coughs> and then the yes. animation. This is all um, defendant quotes. I'm going to bring that in tomorrow, Your Honor, the actual quotes. Okay. And then for Defendant Pettis? We don't have a printed color copy of the slides. We will bring them to you tomorrow. Is it the same that you gave to me last week? It's changed because of your ruling. Oh, yeah. So okay. it is different. Some of it wasn't shown because of time. Um, but I'll give you the whole thing, and then I'll note for the court what wasn't shown. Okay. Um, so why don't we meet at 8.30 to do that, and then discuss anything else, if we have anything more to discuss um, before the jury comes up. And let's try to get an idea of how much more time is um, left on direct exam with Mr. Noble. I would think maybe a half hour. Um, and can you estimate on cross or two hours? And then who will you call after then Mr. We'll call Jeff Stone? All right. And do you think if it sounds like much of the morning will be taken by Mr. Noble? And then how long do you anticipate with Mr. or Officer Stone uh, or Detective Stone? Stone? Probably an hour, hour and a half, because he's the one that gets in all of the evidence, Judge, so we'll have to go through all the evidence with him. Okay. And then if you can estimate on cross. Yep. I guess it depends on the areas of inquiry and what we're allowed to, uh, areas where we'll be allowed to go and we cross. Okay. <laughs> So to be fair, it could be the entire day is it's, 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 it's taken on Detective Stone's testimony and may even bring us to the following day. And may even bring it to what? May even bring us to the following day. Okay. Or Detective Stone, I'll let him know. All right. Anything else then before we recess? Your Honor, if we could get in touch with someone from IT to try and get our uh, our VGA cable fixed so we don't have any delays tomorrow. Yeah, because I was selecting the correct button and on the VGA and then also pressing the button for defense and it didn't seem to respond. And it wouldn't be the first time, Your Honor. I hope I can work with them tonight or in the morning to get it resolved and get everything in. All right. Um, I don't know that I could reach them now, but they are here at 8. So if you want to just, when you get here, if you ring my office, ask Sherry and she should be able to assist you in communicating with them. We will do that. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll be in recess.